only allowed to consider uh, the testimony here from the witness stand and the exhibits uh, that are admitted into evidence. That's what you're supposed to, to base your, your verdict on. So it's important when you're evaluating your cases and, and talking with your clients and doing your investigations uh, that you consider what that evidence is and that you think about it, how you're going to get it in. Um, you know, we, it's an adversarial system. The other side's going to be trying to keep out the evidence that you want to get in. We're trying to keep out some of their stronger evidence or some of the things that, that hurt our cases the most. And frankly, you know the facts of your cases better than the judge does. The judge doesn't know, really doesn't know much about your case at all. And you know where that evidence fits in and how it relates. Um, and so the judge is, is going to try and lean on you and rely on you to educate him about the evidence. Why is it relevant? Why should this be admissible? Uh, you know, where does it fit into the case? And you've got to make a good impression with the judge and show the judge that you're prepared, that you've really thought about the issues uh, as it relates to trying to get in what you're trying to get in and keep out what you're trying to keep out. And if you, you know, if you come across as being unprepared or, or maybe, uh, you know, something you say just doesn't fly right with the judge, uh, the judge in a close call is maybe the next time going to think, well, I, you know, close call, I can't really rely on what Pointer's telling me or, or what have you. But uh, I, I think especially with the rules of evidence, I mean, it's important to be prepared in any aspect of your case opening statements, your theme, your theory, your cross-examinations, for sure. You don't want to get up there and, and wing it, as John's going to tell you here today, uh, a little bit later. But with evidence, that's the area that I think the judge is most frequently called upon in a case to make a ruling. Uh, most of the other times, uh, they're just, you know, how many times have we seen judges who don't really look like they're paying attention? So... It's important to be prepared. And you'll be more comfortable when you're prepared. It'll allow you to be more yourself. It will allow you to be more relaxed and, uh, and that kind of thing to really ease the uh, anxiety there. Uh, the nature of the rules are inclusive. Um, we generally think about the rules of evidence as well. These are all, it seems like all the rules are why evidence should be excluded. But that's not really um, the case. The general rule with the rules of evidence is that all relevant evidence is admissible. And the rules we have are, are kind of the exceptions to that general rule. But keep in mind when you're making your argument to get the evidence in, or uh, you know, mostly when you're making to get it in, that uh, you know, by the very nature, the rules of evidence are rules of inclusion. Flip side of that, if you're trying to keep it out as a judge, some evidence is so inherently unreliable that the jury shouldn't even be allowed to see that or to hear that evidence. Uh, and that's kind of the other side of that. Let's talk about uh, motion practice. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this and then we're going to really talk uh, for a good bit of the time about objections. Um, how and, and when to object, what to say when the judge uh, maybe throws some curveballs at you like he did to Vinny there, when he just kind of flat out overruled, you know. Uh, what are you supposed to do in that? We'll talk about that. Before we get to that, motions. Probably the most critical motion that you can make in a criminal case is, uh, at least as far as, you know, maybe uh, having it really adversely affect your client or, or certainly uh, when you're defending your ineffective assistance of counsel claim, you want to make sure you make your motion for a directed judgment of acquittal. Uh, you want to do that at, uh, at the end of the prosecution's case in chief. Essentially what you want to say is, uh, given the evidence judge and the like most favorable to the prosecution, they fail to make a prima facie case. You know, they've, they haven't met uh, or haven't proved, you know, an essential element of the claim. 
And, uh, you know, it's your burden as the defense lawyer to show that they haven't met that, uh, met that essential element. You'll want to do it again after the defense rests its case, if the defense decides to put on a case. Uh, after the trial, if you end up getting a, an adverse verdict for your client, you'll want to you know, move for a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. Uh, think about making a, a motion for a new trial, that kind of thing. Um, other motions, we all know about motions to suppress evidence. Uh, and most of the time we think about that in you know, a, a confession that was uh, impermissibly obtained or involuntary. Uh, we think about it in the search and seizure issues. Um, I think it's important to file those motions to suppress well in advance. Try and get the judge to set a hearing prior to trial. And a lot of judges are going to say, no, no, we're going to do it on the morning of trial. But if you can get them to, to rule on it well in advance of trial, you'll be much uh, better able to focus your time in your trial preparation um, when thinking about your, your themes and your theory. Because if you know that some evidence is, is definitely not coming out, the judge has already ruled on this issue, then you're better able to focus your time and your preparation. I, I think that's really important. Um, yeah, question? Uh, so yeah, Mark. Just, uh, I, I had a bunch of press hearing yesterday, in fact, in front of Judge Lockett, which I routinely file uh, a bunch of press statements. I didn't particularly care what the outcome was. The judge, he didn't say anything that was damaging. Uh, and I, I started to wonder, I'm like, okay, well, he, he, he denied the motion. But then I started to think, well, does that mean that the state can, is now going to automatically get in everything that somebody that a defendant says? Does, does it have to meet other elements like it's actually a statement against interest? You know, or, or is it well motion? Good question. You, I, if I hear your question right, I think what you're asking is, do your client's statements that he made to the police, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. That confession or whatever it was. Or even if it's not a confession, it was, you talked about how beautiful the weather was that day. Okay. Whatever. Does it now just automatically come in because of the No, no. J just because a motion to suppress is denied does not mean that you can't later on object to that same evidence at trial. Uh, we had this happen in a case uh, a while back where you know the judge denied the, the motion to suppress, but then later on in the trial, uh, you know there was some evidence. Uh, to give you an example, it was a, a Terry Pat, and they found some drugs or whatever it was. And to do the Terry Pat, to do that, you know, frisk search, the officer has to have a it's a reasonable suspicion or an actual fear, something like that. Uh, and he had testified uh, on cross-examination, you know, I asked him, I said, well, you, you weren't, like, afraid of this guy or anything, were you? No, I wasn't. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, made the objection at that point, and certainly uh, uh, it should have been kept out, and the judge didn't, and that's a whole different story. But you absolutely can renew the same, the same reasons. Um, your search and seizure issues even, these can become jury questions. Just because the judge denies your motion to suppress doesn't mean that it's not still going to be an issue in the case. I, I have heard um, that a judge um, that a, a motion to suppress can be argued to the jury. Oh, yeah. It's not like you're kind of touching on the same thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like the jury could hear the statement and then decide themselves if they should, if they should unring the bell and, and in a sense yeah. grant the Vince, I think in, in your case, if what your client said at the time to the officer isn't really relevant to anything to his what he's being charged with, you can raise well, that I'll, at the I'll, trial. I won't say that it's not relevant. I'll say that it wasn't, it wasn't what I would call incriminating in the deal. Say, so, oh, well, yeah, yes, it is, but really it's not. It was an effective denial. You know? Maybe you want to get that evidence in. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that may be part of your strategy. You know, you got to think about it. You got to uh, you got to calculate how it's going to play out. And uh, you know, you, you may 
may not want it in, but you might be okay. You know, even if you object to it at trial, if it comes in, it sounds like there's other things you can do. With it. Absolutely, and, and the thing is, if you don't do it, your record may not be preserved. Um, and I would argue to you, and I would suggest to you, that the better practice is to go ahead and, even though you've already filed your motion to suppress, the judge has denied it, go ahead and object to it again at trial, just in case, you know, unless your trial strategy has changed, like you said. Jane Jones, when I was up there, she was sitting there, she wrote me a note right after, like you said, the motion to suppress denied it, she, she wrote down, need to object because if you don't, it's not preserved for the record. And I said, Judge, my state co-counsel tells me I need to object, so he said noted. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I did get he ruled. Well, I, I think you know if he rules on a motion to suppress at pretrial, you are preserved. Now, if it was a motion limine that he, you know, well, did not. I mean, it, it's a good practice. I, I know I did appellate law for a little while, and you know, when you're um, writing appellate briefs and everything, you sit there and you read all the transcripts, and you're thinking, how could these lawyers be so stupid? Why didn't they object to this? Not realizing when you're doing it in real time, you know, you don't think as quick. You know. so, but yeah, it's always a good rule to, to bring it back up. But as much as the press, you're preserved. And you never know. Maybe after hearing where the evidence fits into the case, and and how it played out at trial. Maybe the judge heard something different. I mean, maybe, maybe he's going to change his mind. Maybe she read a case yesterday. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't know. I just seemed to follow somebody's advice. But it was, you know, particularly in front of the judge, I'm not going to be penalized. Maybe you wouldn't do certain things in front of a jury. But in front of a judge, you, you're not losing anything. No, if you got a bench trial, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. This, and you never know. You may get lucky. The judge may change his mind, too. Um, in addition to motions to suppress, there's <coughs> motions in limiting. Um, and this is really any evidence that you want to keep out at trial, that you anticipate uh, the other side trying to get into evidence, that you want the judge to go ahead and rule pre-trial on. You don't even want it to be an issue in, in court. Because let me suggest to you, you don't want these kind of surprises coming up at trial. The more you can have your theory, the more you know what's going to come in, the better off you'll be, the better off you'll be able to prepare and, and, and strategize. So go ahead, see if you can get the judge to rule on it, again, well in advance of trial so that you can prepare accordingly. Um, motions to sever are, and I think I've got bifurcate also, that's more of a, a civil thing, that doesn't really apply here, but you can sever defendants. Most, most of us know that, right? If you've got a co-defendant in a case and the prosecution wants to try them together, uh, you may not want your client to be sitting at the table with, uh, you know, the guy who's going to testify and, uh, you know, has been convicted of uh, five felony offenses in the past. That's not going to make your guy look very good. So in this case, for instance, um, in the Gambini case, if I'm representing Rothenstein, uh, you know, I've really got to talk with my client about do I want to be sitting at the same table with the primary murder suspect? Uh, and I don't think I do. One consideration, though, you want to have there is once the prosecution tries a case the first time, you know, they may make some mistakes the first time. They got a bunch of cases, right? They don't have as much time to prepare. We've only got, you know, the one case maybe that's going to trial that day. Prosecution might have five or six cases that they've kind of, kind of theoretically prepared for. After they've tried it one time, they're going to be a lot more prepared the second time around. And if your guy ends up being the defendant that's tried for the second time, that may put you at a disadvantage. So just a consideration there. Yeah. But if you end up in that situation, you get the transcripts of the previous testimony, so you might be able to get some inconsistencies. That's, that's a great point, Spencer. It, that, how, how helpful is that to have in your investigation when you've got those transcripts? That's, 